Yeah, okay. So, do you want me to start now? Yes, that'd be great. Thanks, Helena. So, thank you, Alex, for inviting me to talk today, and thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, Pastures for the Future has become a bit of a, a bit of a passion for me. We're um, we're very interested in understanding how our pastures can help sequester carbon and survive a future climate that's going to be different. So, Rod and I attended a um, climate change workshop back in 2006, where we were warned that we were going to get hotter, drier, uh, less predictable weather, and especially in the tablelands here, which is always considered a very safe area. And uh, we decided back then in 2006 to start preparing our pastures and preparing our farm for a very different climate. Um, since we bought the property here in 2001, we've certainly noticed a change in the temperatures, the, the rainfall, and the type of pastures that we're growing. Uh, my background is I'm I, formerly with New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, and I've, I have been a project officer with uh, uh, Hawkesbury Nepean Catchment Management Authority back then when we had CMAs before the LLS started. And uh, we were working on um, pasture sus sustainability projects even back then in 2006 to 2009. I left the department in 2009 and since then have set up, we run a, a, a beef cattle stud here and I'm also a riding instructor. So I've changed my path, but I've still got a pretty strong passion with, for, for grasslands and pastures. And I'm a committee member of the New South Wales Grassland Society. And just sort of to keep my hand in, in looking after pastures. So today I really want to cover what Alex has outlined in the invitation to everybody, which is to, to look at plants and pastures, definitions of some, some pastures, um, to start for getting people to start thinking about their process of improving their pastures or, or preparing their pastures for a different climate or just improving their properties if they, if they need to for what they've got now to work into the future. Um, talk a bit, a little tiny bit on plant suitability for different um, enterprises, but that's a little bit of a hard one because I don't know what your enterprise is. But we can certainly cover it and look at it and I can send you to some resources. So the first question was, was the difference between a C3 and a C4 pasture? Um, we can classify our plants a lot of ways. We talk about whether they're broad leaves or grasses or perennials and annuals and short-lived perennials and um, natives introduced, naturalised, C3, C4, tropical, temperate, weeds, useful, forbs, herbs, shrubs, trees. There are all ways we describe our pastures. But the question today was what is the difference between a C3 and a C4? So here's a table of the differences. And the main thing is, is it's the initial molecule formed during photosynthesis, which defines a plant as whether it's a C3 or a C4. C3 is a more ancient type of, uh, or let me say more ancient, it's, it's the initial earlier on in evolution, the C3 plants were the first ones to evolve. The C4 plants is a more recent evolution of plants. What it actually helps the plant to do is to grow in its particular environment. So a C3 prefers cool season, so they're winter growing or early spring growing. They have a lower light requirement, they have a lower temperature, they can grow in lower temperatures, they have a higher moisture requirement, they can cope with frost, they have a higher feed quality, but they have a lower production. Then the C4s, which their initial um, molecule formed during photosynthesis has four carbons in it. They are warm season and they cope with um, higher temperatures and lower moisture requirements. So the C3s are what we call our temperate grasses or our, or our cool season growing grasses. Our C4s are tropical grasses or our warm season growing grasses. So that is the main difference. Now to confuse you with the with the, temp the little diagram I've got, um, 
the, the C3 grasses, when they photosynthesize, it's a one step process. They produce a, a three carbon molecule. They go through a cycle in, through this process, um, they produce a glucose molecule. The C4 plant is a two stage process. They produce a C4, which then goes on to the Calvin cycle to produce glucose. One of the explanations I had as to why a C4 grass has lower quality is because it uses energy in, the, in this step here. The C4 step going into the Calvin cycle, it uses energy to go through that step. Um, so it actually has less energy available in the plant. So it becomes um, lower quality. So a C4 pasture is not usually used for finishing livestock. Uh, without supplements. You can, you can use it as the main grass, but you probably, probably have to supplement with a grain or something. Um, but this step here also makes the plant uh, require less more water to grow. So it has biological advantages over a C3. So that is the main difference between a C3 and a C4. So some examples, Microlina is what we just, we talk about it being a, a native perennial grass, it's a C3. It will grow year round in the right conditions, but it will grow through winter. Red grass, on the other hand, is a C4, and it, you will find it will go dormant through winter in this climate. We have our, this year we seem to have an abundance of our C3 broadleaf annual weeds of Cape, Cape weed and Storksbill, and you will see these ones are described as C3s. Paspalum is a perennial C4 grass that's been introduced. Now I took this photo the other day. This dead grass in the, in the foreground is all Paspalum, which has gone dormant over winter, but in, this is now coming into spring and you can see that there is regrowth occurring in the small picture on the right of your screen. Um, there's regrowth occurring in that dead material. So it is now starting to come out of dormancy because it doesn't cope with cold. It will survive the cold in a dormant state, but it, it will start to grow when the weather starts to warm up. Millet, C4 grass, which is introduced. We've used this as a, um, as a, as a crop to uh, get rid of weeds out of a particular pasture that which we were re-sowing and it was what we call our break crop. So we, we broke the weed cycle using this C4 millet but it will die on the first frost. It will not cope with any frost. And as it's an annual, if it hasn't set seed, um, you no longer have it in your pasture. Other examples. So Phalaris coxfoot perennial grasses, subclover um, is an annual legume. These are all C3s. Wallaby grass and oats are all C3s. Kakuyu, lucerne, kangaroo grass, sorghum, uh, our C4s, so they grow through summer. I hope that explains to everybody the difference between a C3 and a C4. Um, another question that came to, to be covered by this webinar was how to establish a new pasture. And I think what everybody really needs to know is that there is no prescription for establishing a new pasture. In my experience, if you ask 10 agronomists how to, what to do to establish a new pasture, you will get 10 opinions and 10 answers. Because there is, there is nothing that, that an agronomist, or you go up and say to an agronomist, what do I need to do to establish a pasture? I will ask you a heap of questions, or if you ask me, or if you ask any agronomist, you'll be asked a whole stack of questions before you get any sort of an answer. So what do you need or want from that pasture? What will grow in your environment? What are you prepared to spend? Um, can you do it by what we call evolution or revolution? The evolution of a pasture is, have you got enough of the useful species in your, um, already on your paddock that you can use those species get rid of weeds, get rid of undesirable species out of that pasture and promote the growth of, of the pasture that you want? Or is there too many weeds, too many, um, especially grass weeds, like 
serrated tussock or something similar, do you have to get rid of those by spraying out before and then have to re-sow a new pasture? So that, that's what I consider the revol a revolution. Most importantly, have you soil tested so that you can identify if you've got any uh, pasture, uh, paddock limitations, soil limitations, any nutrient deficiencies, and if you've got any of those, can they be fixed uh, within your budget? So, you know, there are sometimes I do soil test reports for groups, and the, the farmer looks at how much fertiliser they have to apply to get up to the most productive their pasture can be, and they say, well, I can't afford all of that. That's fair enough. It's, it's a decision that the farmer needs to make based on what do you need or want for your pasture. And the other important consideration is, is there enough moisture? You can't grow, you can't germinate new seedlings unless there's enough moisture in the soil and it needs to be stored moisture, not just what's, what's predicted for tomorrow because the seedlings might germinate and then have nothing to, to grow on and then they'll die and then you've got to start again. So an example of what do you need or want, there are pasture plants that are absolutely suitable for, for cattle production or for sheep production or for production animals that are absolutely not suitable for other, other animals. And you'll see this example with horses, which are prone to laminitis. That was the picture there is um, our next door neighbor's horse. And uh, despite several warnings that this horse was going to founder, they did nothing and the horse did founder and ultimately had to be put down. But he was, he was living on um, pastures that were suitable for cattle and sheep, but certainly not suitable for like for this for this particular horse or for any horse that's laminitic prone. Same thing can be said for other livestock. Goats don't do well necessarily on grazing, they prefer browsing. Um, alpaca might have some, uh, you might need to consider different pastures for different species like alpaca who are more sensitive to, um, to weed burdens. So where do you get some of this information for, for your specific industry? Um, very good place is AgriFutures. It used to be called the Rural Industries Research and Development Corporation or RURDIC. It's now changed its name to AgriFutures. If you go to the AgriFutures website, you will find a whole heap of different um, livestock listed and there's lots of documents which are all downloaded, free, free documents, all downloadable on PDF, um, specific to your industry and specific to what you want. So um, horse industry, you know, and what sort of pastures suit horse, the horse industry and especially laminated horses. This book, Plants Poisonous to Horses, is probably one of the best, doc best books that I've seen for not just plants poisonous to horses, but plants poisonous to a lot of li uh, livestock industries. Um, and of course, goats, alpaca, there's, there's sheep, there's cattle, there's, um, there's even bees and free range pigs and all sorts of information in, in that website. So what is a suitable pasture? The enterprise choice is very much determined by your farm's production capability. You won't be running a, a dairy farm at Bungonia. The land is not capable to do it. You can, however, run merino weathers or something at, at that area because the land is more suitable to that productivity. So the grasses that you can grow is also very much determined by you, the, the production capability of your farm. So ryegrass, which is a very good feed for dairy cows and for fattening livestock, um, is, is will, will not necessarily grow in some environments. You need to have clover in the system if you're going to finish, uh, finish animals or have lactating cows or sheep. Um, Phalaris fescue, suitable for lactation and growth, but not necessarily for finishing steers. Some of the native grasses, suitable for, for sheep, alpaca and horses. So microlina is, is a particularly good pasture for sheep and, and, and horses and alpaca. Not very good for cattle because it doesn't get long enough for cattle to be able to eat it easily. Um, Paspalum, C4 natives, useful for sheep, dry cattle, 
and a small amount of um, late lactation, but you certainly couldn't use it for uh, early lactation animals. Um, and dead standing pasture for any type of dry livestock, but not suitable for animals that you're finishing or trying to, to, uh, to grow on. There's a course called Prograze. Some of you may have already done it, but uh, that's a, an eight session course provided by the uh, LLS. And that will certainly be able to give you more information on specific livestock and information that you might need to determine um, your animal's production needs. Alex has sent you links to some of these documents. So um, the Prime Fact, which is the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries document on rejuvenating part, perennial pastures. A lot of information there on how to improve your pasture um, by evolution and the same with weed removers, pasture improvers from the MLA how to improve your pastures without actually having to replace them completely. But there is also information on if you get to the stage where you realise you've got to replace it, how you go about that as well, especially in the rejuvenated, rejuvenating perennial pastures uh, document. So very, very useful bits of advice in these two documents. So if you need more information on uh, preparing, a pa uh, putting in new pastures or fixing your old pastures, certainly give those a read. Now, something that a lot of people don't realise is that we have what's called the law of the minimum. In other words, if there is one nutrient missing in your paddock, your pasture will grow to the maximum amount of pasture that uh, will, nutrient that will that is available. So, if if you are deficient in, let's say, phosphorus, your pasture will only grow, and in this case, we, we described it with a, a barrel holding water. If your barrel is leaking because it's low in phosphorus, it'll leak and it'll only produce the pasture up to the halfway up that barrel. If you plug that hole and there's no other limitations, you might be able to grow the, um, twice as much pasture to the top of the barrel. Problem is, is that it's not just a nutrient deficiency that's going to um, cause this reduction in, uh, in pasture production. Your limitation might be soil depth or soil type, um, which is something you can't change. So in that instance, you need to grow the species of grasses that is suitable for that particular uh, type of soil or, or depth of soil. Your other limitation might be something that you can change. So rotational grazing is a very good way of improving your pastures um, by allowing the useful uh, species to grow on. So your limitation might be that you haven't fenced your paddocks enough or you don't have water in some paddocks. So your limitations aren't necessarily um, uh, nutrient wise, they could be management or they could be something that you can't change. And certainly things like rainfall is something we can't change and we have to learn to adapt with a, with a different rainfall pattern to what we, we had in the past. Um, so our hole in the bottom of the bucket or our missing stave in, the, in our barrel might be something we, can't, we have no control over. But if you've got control over your management, your nutrient requirements, your soil pH, all those things, if you can control it, um, and you want to improve the amount of pasture you're growing, uh, by all means, fix the problems and learn to live with things you can't change, um, such as soil depth or aspect or slope or those sorts of problems. So the next question, what is your budget? Um, can you afford to have, have you got an unlimited budget to go out and fix every single problem in every single paddock? Or do you have to set yourself a budget and set yourself a plan and um, decide what you're going to do. So if you're going to do a complete paddock replacement, you've got to consider things of the cost of preparing seed beds and getting rid of weeds and getting rid of, and, and perhaps growing an annual crop as a break crop. Um, if you want to go a complete pasture replacement, if you want to try to, to improve the existing pastures, there's still got to be a cost because you've got to get rid of weeds, you've got to get um, 
you've got to consider uh, what is there and try and do that improvement um, just through well, there is going to be a cost if you are going to improve existing pastures. It might be a nutrient cost, it might be a fencing cost, it might be improving water supply cost. But you might have to consider what your budget is and what you're prepared to spend before you go ahead and start the program. You need to be able to identify what's there. And if you can't identify what's there, this afternoon's uh, plant identification session is um, is going to be quite useful for those people that need to either learn what's there or have a brush up on how to identify plants because you're going to have grassy weeds, broadleaf weeds, you're going to have useful grasses, broadleaf, useful broadleafs and you're going to have possibly bare ground. So they're the sort of things that you really need to look at and say well I've got 20% of useful grasses in my paddock 80% is bare ground and not useful grasses. Can I promote that 20% to, to, uh, to grow really well? So that's a consideration for, for you know, that you need to make. It's, can I identify the plant and pastures and what I've got, have I got enough to fix it and, and not have to replace that pasture? Um, this method of, of identifying your, uh, the, botanical composition of your pastures and, and assessing if you've got enough pastures is described on the um, rejuvenating perennial pastures document that you've got a, you should be able to have a copy of. It's appendix one on page six and it's called the pointed stick method. So what you do is you have a stick with a, a point on both ends, you throw the stick in front of you, you walk to it and you identify what's this, the point is pointing to on both sides. You do that 50 times and that will then tell you your percentage of bare ground, percentage of different types of grasses, different types of broadleaves, different weeds, useful, not useful. And then from that you can work out whether or not you should be, um, whether or not you can use uh, the evolution method of fixing your pasture. Soil factors and fertility is a huge one. Um, some of the factors, well, they're not just soil factors. Some of them are environmental factors, such as land class and aspect, soil depth, texture and structure of the soil. They're, they're important. The soil test will address um, limitations like salinity, sodicity, pH, and how much aluminium is in the soil, and also tell you what the nutrient levels in the soil are, and there is um, a lot of information around on how to fix any limitations if you can, um, but some of these up here, unfortunately, are ones that we can't change. Well, not unfortunately, but they're, they're, what we've, they're what your property has got and it's what you need to live with. So what do we mean by land class? This is an eight class system of of land classes. There used to be a five class system which was um, a little bit harder to classify the, your, your land class. But what we consider a land class one and two are these highly arable soils that can be um, fertile, uh, that can be cropped at any time. Now these are the, the Liverpool Plains um, black soils that get cropped for wheat or cropped for, they're, they're constantly cropped and they can cope with that constant cropping. There's very few soils like that in Australia. Class three and four are the ones that are suitable for grazing. They can be uh, cultivated or cropped for short periods, but not, not for too long. And it's best to have the crops in rotation with pastures. And they have a slightly higher erosion risk than land class one or two. Land classes, five and six, suitable for grazing, not for cultivation. So you really need to maintain uh, a ground cover on these types of soils all the time because they're, they're, they're a high erosion risk, usually because they're steeper than the one and two, one to four. The sevens and eights are the lands, that, the land that we say is best retired from agriculture or um, used for very light grazing. So we might run some merino weathers out the back of these paddocks and or mountain goats might be able to survive out there. But 
potentially they need to be retired, they need to be fenced off. And these would include areas of um, wetlands uh, that are not suitable for grazing and also very steep country. And as you can see, we've got a mountain climber on that one. So you've got to consider what land class you've got. So when, we can, when we're looking at a landscape, just looking over, the, you know, over one valley, there might be several landscapes. This area here might be a landscape two, might be this area down in the foreground might have a little, might be a bit more of a slope, might be a land class three, so we can do some light, um, light cropping on it. And then we're going into areas which are steeper, um, which can be used for grazing. And there's some area in here, I don't know why they haven't cleared this area, but it might be rocks, might be something else that in this area might be used for very light grazing, and it would be considered a land class five, six, maybe a seven. I don't know. But even just looking at a landscape, uh, you can see that there's a number of land classes in, in just one snapshot. Can we talk about aspect? So, you know, people talk about having a northeasterly aspect. We've certainly got a paddock, which our favoured area of the farm is our northeast facing part of the property at the, at the very back. And that area can certainly grow more feed than a west facing slope, which is exposed to higher rainfall events, uh, more severe storms and hot sun, hot weather, uh, afternoon sun grows a lot less feed than these different aspects. There are seasonal differences in aspects. The south southerly aspect doesn't grow as much feed in winter. Um, the easterly aspect tends to grow feed all year round. This westerly aspect might be a very good area for growing winter grasses because it does get more sun and it does get more rain. But certainly aspect is important when we're considering the capability of our farm. The rock type that you've got, so people talk about having basalt soil or a granite soil or a, sh a sh sandstone soil or shales and various things. There's a, a difference in the potential of the fertility of, of the soils produced by these different rock types. Basalt soils are always considered a better, a better um, more fertile soil than a granite but you can see that there's a huge overlap. So a good granite might be better than a, than a poor basalt. I've discussed this as the soil fertility potential. What we're finding in the areas, especially a lot of farmers have chosen to stop using fertilizer, especially when it got to be very expensive back in the um, early 2000s. Farmers said, oh, they couldn't afford to fertilize. Um, so a lot of these uh, soils, are now completely run down of, of available nutrient, but by feeding these soils, you've got a you can um, improve their, fertil their fertility. So the soil fertility is not; it's always going to be highly fertile. It has the potential to be more fertile. So basalt soil has a potential to hold on to more soil nutrients than a sandstone soil or a sandy soil because there are more clay particles in this basalt soil which can hang on to the nutrient than a sandy soil which can't hang on to that nutrient. So if you feed a basalt soil and it has adequate fertility, it's going to be much, have a much higher potential to grow pasture than a, a sandstone or a shale. But as you can see, there's a huge overlap. Your best shales could be as good as your moderate granites can be as good as your, your poor basalts. But that's another thing to consider. And how you fertilize these soils is, is dependent on um, how much clay is in there. So a basalt soil that has the potential to hold more nutrient, you might actually give it more nutrient so that, um, and it'll hold it for longer, but a sandstone, sandy soil, you might have to um, fertilize it more often, more, you know, with smaller amounts so that you don't lose it due to erosion or due to bleaching. So the two different soils in the region, we have a, a, a shallow sandy soil at Tarago, and you can see it's, it is growing grass, but it's dominated by, by native grasses compared to a deep clay loam soil over at Taralga, lovely deep rich basalt soil, 
um, can be cultivated, potential to grow a lot more feed, um, and uh, has, has a much higher fertility potential than, um, than this shallow soil at, at Tarago. And you see examples of this all over the district. Um, you can even see examples of this very close together. You know, you can have a basalt soil uh, with, a, with a shale hill behind it. So it's, it's not to say that it's not um, location specific, but you do have to uh, consider what, your, what parts of your farm is more arable and this other, than other parts which may have to be retired from agriculture. A little bit on soil texture, what we mean by soil texture. Um, a, a, a clay soil, a clay has very small particles, um, silt slightly larger, sand even larger, um, and it's the quantity of these different amounts of uh, particles that describes your soil. So a clay soil has a lot of clay, then we can have a clay loam or a sandy clay loam or a loamy clay sand. So the, the breakdown of each individual, um, the, the, uh, what, what the actual crumb is made up of um, is important. And then the amount, amount of organic matter which holds those crumbs together is very important to a soil. So soils that have, have, got, have lost their organic matter, um, don't, these crumbs don't hold together well. But soil texture is quite specific to, uh, to different soils and important for you to understand if you're going to fertilise your soil, what texture you've got. Um, this is a very useful resource for soil test interpretation. Um, I was co-author on this document in um, 2006. Uh, it can be downloaded from the, uh, as a PDF from the New South Wales Department of Prime Industry website. If you just type in fertilisers for pastures, uh, New South Wales DPI to a Google search, you'll, you'll get this document. Um, and it, it goes through individual uh, soil limitations, plant limit, nutrient limitations, and gives you some useful, useful advice on um, how to fertilise your farm. It's a bit of a roadmap on uh, where are you now, where do you need to be, and how do you get there. We have written a new version, version for the LLS, um, but we're waiting on um, copyright permission to print it. So that hopefully will be available. The, the new version will be um, available hopefully next year. Uh, it includes sections on subsurface pH and organic carbon, which wasn't included in this document. So um, it, it's, it's uh, probably updated to be a more modern version for uh, including new research information. So when we talk about um, the soil limitations on these plants, um, we, there's quite a few plants that won't grow in some situations. So in a waterlogged soil or a wet soil, Coxfoot is not going to like it. It's going to turn up its toes and say, no, sorry, not going to grow there. But fescue will grow there. But fescue probably won't grow on the top of a hill like Coxfoot will. Um, in an acid situation, lucerne will not tolerate any acidity um, mainly because it won't tolerate the, the uh, aluminium that is associated with that low pH. Whereas a plant called Ceredella, um, and there's others called, another one called Biocerula, they will cope with acid soils. Uh, there's been a fair bit of research done on uh, Ceredella in this tablelands area. It will grow, but the problem with it at the moment is that they haven't got a variety that will persist in this colder weather. So it's, it will grow, but it will only grow for one or two seasons. Um, and in that picture, I don't know if you can actually see it, the Ceredella is actually growing. This is a um, picture of Ceredella. You can see the Ceredella growing. It's the, it's the broadleaf plant there. The plant that it's growing with here, the grass, is actually vulpia or, or silver grass, which dominates um, low pH situations. So even though the Ceredella will grow, the pasture that's growing with it isn't all that useful. Um, so 
plant choice here, yes, we can grow cerdella in an acid soil, but should we be coping? We should we be changing the acidity, the pH of that soil? Um, Coxfoot too, it will grow in an acid situation more so than Phalaris will. Uh, if you've got saline soils or waterlogged soils and you're looking for a clover that will grow, Balanza clover will grow in that situation, but rose clover won't grow. So picking your plants to suit your plant limitations might be as useful as trying to change those limitations. Um, the Grassland Society has just got copyright approval to produce a new pasture variety guide and that pasture variety guide will also include issue, uh, issues on um, plant suitability for, uh, for uh, soil limitations. That, um, that new document should be available by mid next year. Uh, Grassland, Con Grassland Society Conference is on in July at Mittagong and I think they'll be aiming to get this new variety guide out for the conference. Soil moisture considerations if you go to sow. Um, it's a very good website called Farming Forecaster. It's, um, it's a collection of soil moisture probes and soil temperature probes in the region. And there are probes in many different sites uh, from the Southern Highlands. So there's, a, there's a, uh, probes in the, at Sutton Forest, for instance. There's probes around Lake Bathurst. I think they go down now as far as Cooma. Might even go even further now that they've been putting more and more probes in. Um, I always use the probe that's at Lagan. There's probes at Lake Bathurst. Uh, there's, this one's at Bannister. So I'll just put these in as, as an example of the moisture availability from September 2019 to September 2020. So if you were wanting to sow a new pasture, you have no hope of getting a pasture to establish if you're in that Lake Bathurst area. There was just not enough moisture available in the soil um, compared to Lagan, which is the probe I use, which we started to get rainfall in February. So our moisture profile went up in, in, um, in March. Bannister never really got dry but it got wetter once it started raining in, in February. The different, um, so we've got a, a different colours down from top to bottom. The red is in the 0 to 10 centimetre zone of the soil. The green is in the 10 to 20. The yellow is, is uh, 20 to 40, I think, to 40 centimetres. And the blue is at 60 centimetres. The recommendation is you don't sow a paddock, if you've got to re-sow a pasture, you don't sow a paddock unless you've got soil moisture to 20 centimetres. So in other words, you're looking at this green line here, the bottom of this green line, where it joins the yellow. If that profile isn't full, you would not try sowing a new pasture. So we can see here at Lake Bathurst, that profile didn't fill up until September this year. So you wouldn't try sowing a pasture back here in March knowing that you don't have enough more soil moisture. You got days where you've got rainfall events, but the soil dried out very quickly compared to banister on a basalt soil, which that moisture was held. You know, you wouldn't try it here in the, uh, in January, that was too dry here. There was still moisture down at 60 centimetres, but not enough um, in the 10 to, uh, 10 to 20 centimetre layer to consider sowing a pasture until it got to uh, March, uh, March, we started to get enough moisture. Um, this website is very, very useful. Um, it gives you soil temperature. So millet, for example, when we were sowing our millet, we didn't, you don't sow your millet until the soil temperature gets to 14 degrees. So we were keeping an eye on the lag and probe. We had enough moisture and as soon as the, um, the soil temperature got to 16 degrees, we sowed our millet and it was, we were able to graze it by December. But if we tried to sow it in September, the soil temperature would have been too cold and the risk of frost was too high. Other information that's on this farming forecaster website is, uh, is what the, um, the 
plant growth is looking like, so the pasture growth rate. So uh, in winter, pasture growth rate might be only down to two kilograms per hectare um, per day, whereas at the moment, I think the pasture growth rate's running at about 50 or 60 kilograms per hectare per day. So it's also a useful tool for assessing how much feed is available for your stock that's going to be growing and be in front of you. Um, if, you would, if you want to look for that website, just go to, um, just, just Google Farming Forecaster. Grazing management is, is also going to be important if you want to assess, if you want to um, produce a new pasture or if you want to um, uh, try and, and sort of by evolution change the pasture that you've got. But you really need to be able to assess your pasture, rotationally graze it, give it time to grow and recover, and um, uh, really know the process. There's a, there's a process with each individual plant species of when you should be grazing it, when you should be resting it, and that, is, that can be quite specific. So your grazing management is really something that you need to get a handle on. I know there are some people that use um, time control grazing, but that doesn't get down to the specifics of what individual species need. So if you want to promote filarious growth, for instance, it is best to rest it in January uh, while it's setting seed, so that it also, uh, sorry, not January, uh, when it's setting seed, so probably um, November, October, November, so that it not only sets the seed, but it also replenishes the, um, the, the um, glucose stored in its basal buds and its root system. So timing is very important when you're talking about grazing management. So this is a, a case study that we did on the, well, that I've prepared on the paddock that we, um, completely re, uh, re, rejuvenated. We took out the old pasture and, and replaced it with a new one. The reason we took out the old pasture, it was, it was a Danthonia or a wallaby grass pasture, but it was a very strange variety of wallaby grass. There's a lot of different varieties of wallaby grass and species of wallaby grass. And this particular one, was the sh it was so tough, the cattle couldn't even eat it. You put a mob of cows in and they'd stand there looking hungry because the shear strength of that Danthonia was so hard that the cattle couldn't break it. We used, it used to make very good silage, but it didn't make very good cattle feed for grazing. So we decided back in 2000, well, we decided some time ago that we were gonna remove it and replace it, but we started the process in 2016. The first step was to soil test the paddock and address any limitations that that paddock had. Um, we did a, we sprayed it out more than once. I think it was sprayed out three or four times with Roundup to take all the weeds out, take the, the existing pasture out. We then applied lime. Now we, pl we ploughed the lime in and that's now, with what we know now with, with new research, um, we wouldn't plough now. We would just surface apply the lime before we uh, sowed the new pasture. But this was done a good 12 months before we actually sowed the, the new pasture. Um, we then sowed it to millet with fertiliser and we were able to graze it from December to May. The plan was as we were going to re-sow it in April, uh, but we got tied up with the drought then. So we sprayed it out in August. We waited until the break of season, sprayed it out in August 2018. Um, we sowed Phalaris and clover, uh, we didn't sow clover because it's September's too late to, grow, to sow clover. So we just sowed the uh, Phalaris into it and we were grazing it by December 2018. So this was sown in September 2018. We got some good rainfall events on it and um, we were grazing by the end of that year, first year. And then it was fertilised again in March 2019. Um, this step of ploughing, the reason we would omit it now is that we got some very big rainfall events when this uh, pasture was first sown. And the scary part was, is that with our soil type being quite erodible, we were at risk of sending the entire paddock down, down the creek 
into Wyang into the um, Wyangla Dam. So after we had that experience, we decided to no no longer plough, and our prepared seed bed was and is now done by with a with an aerator or something called an aerator that doesn't disturb as much soil, but it does do it still prepares a seed bed. Um, this is a photo that I took of it in um, September 2020, so it was only last month. Um, if I took a photo of it today with the dog sitting there, you wouldn't see the dog. It's now covered in grass and this paddock, we're um, planning to harvest it for silage, hopefully next week if the contractors turn up. They were supposed to come this week, but they haven't turned up yet, so we're getting a bit nervous with the amount of rain that's coming. So that's how we did it on a larger scale. That was a six hectare paddock. Um, if you've only got a smaller area, it can, you, can, you don't need to use a lot of equipment. Uh, you can certainly, uh, in a small paddock, you could, you know, any weeds can be removed by chipping or by spraying small areas with a hand sprayer. It's still important to soil test. You've, really, you've still got to deal with the issues that you get from those soil tests. Um, if you want to fertilise, it's just it's it's quite easy to broadcast fertiliser by hand. Just have a bucket and just walk around and just throw it out. Um, there's also mechanical ways of um, broadcasting fertiliser. You can have one of those little um, lawn fertiliser um, units that you just put the fertiliser in it and just turn the handle and it'll it'll uh, spray the just broadcast the fertiliser for you. If you've got horses or animals which you can um, collect the manure out of the stable or out of the yard or uh, alpaca certainly um, very good at manuring in one area, collect that manure and put it on any bare areas and possibly sprinkle some seed over it. It's another way. Um, another way that I've seen another person do it, it was, a, it was after equine influenza and she got stuck with 16 horses on her small property because of the standstill and her play, property was absolutely denuded by the end of the uh, standstill. So she, she fed um, untreated coxfoot seed to her horses. She would just put a handful in, the, in their seed every day. And after about 12 months, she had noticeable um, growth of coxfoot in all of her pastures. Um, it, was, it was quite an interesting way of doing it. Um, but as I said, it has to be untreated seed or or you can use some um, hay that you know has got seed in it. The danger there is that you, if it's got seed in it, it might also have weed seeds in it. So that's a little bit more dangerous way of doing it using hay, but you can certainly do it with, um, with a, putting a handful of useful seeds into their feed and the seed will just go through the horse and be deposited in the manure and then possibly just harrow that paddock um, when the horses come out and will spread the seed in its own little packet of fertiliser. Quite a few of you, um, the question was, how do you manage native pastures? We, uh, Alex has sent you a link for the tips and tools handout from um, Meat and Livestock Australia. Um, but there were some important rules of thumb in that document. One of them was to not overgraze. It's, it's always a problem with any pastures. Um, overgrazing will create all sorts of problems. Um, so it's important that you're able to uh, rotate your paddocks if, even if, the, if, if it's native pasture. If you've got weeds in amongst your native pastures, you, you, there are some grazing methods you can use. Um, so spray grazing techniques and, and um, crash grazing techniques that can re remove uh, weed species, grass weed species. Cultivation is a major problem for some of our um, native species especially kangaroo grass. It, it, if you cultivate a kangaroo grass pasture, you will lose it completely and very little chance of getting it back. There are some fertilizers that are suitable for some native species. So microlina, for example, will respond positively to phosphorus fertilizers. Um, kangaroo grass, you will lose it. So you have to know which species you've got and find out whether they respond positively or negatively to, to uh, certain fertilisers. You can allow them to set seed at certain times. Native grasses are very good at regenerating from seed in a natural environment. It's a lot harder to get um, native grasses to establish from sown seed and the seed 
is very, very expensive for, um, for these native grasses because their harvesting technique is very difficult and they don't seed in the, on a particular seed stem doesn't all germinate or doesn't all mature at the same time. So if you harvested the um, Microlina seed, for example, it's possibly, possibly only a third of the seed is um, viable and that's an environmental uh, survival technique of the plant that it's got viable seed on it most of the time that it's seeding rather than just having all of the seed available to germinate at one time like uh, cereals for instance will do. They'll all, they'll all mature at the same time which is very good as a crop we can harvest and, and use, so, you know, wheat crops and things if they had a variable har a, um, ripening rate they would be very hard to use it as for, for a farm. One of the recommendations in that uh, grazing management for productive native pastures document was that you graze to a thousand kilograms per hectare after the autumn break, but you, um, in summer, you graze to 1500 to 3000 kilograms per hectare. Um, they might be just numbers to you. So I've, here is a visual uh, rec uh, uh, picture, uh, pictures for you to have a look at. So an 800 kilogram per hectare pasture, if you set a matchbox upright in it, into it, it would just cover the bottom of the matchbox. That's for 800, this recommends 1,000. So it's a little bit bigger than this particular um, example. Summer graze to 1,500 to 3,000 kilograms. This is 1,800 kilograms. So 3,000 kilograms is quite a bit more. You might lose a matchbox in a 3,000 kilogram per hectare pasture, but you certainly in summer, you don't want to graze your native pastures harder than this diagram here. So that just gives you some a visual look, but it can be a good idea if you actually learn how to do a, a pasture cut and train your eye to understand what the different pasture um, quantities look like. One of the big problems we have, I think, around the tablelands is a lot of people are grazing at lower than 800 kilograms per hectare. Um, the pastures get denuded and they get open up for, uh, for weed invasion. It also recommends 70% ground cover. This is what 70% ground cover looks like. You can see little areas of bare ground in amongst the grasses, but you don't want to have your pastures opened up any more than that if you are wanting to uh, support your native grasses to grow. And there's a whole lot of benefits which, which happens when your ground cover exceeds 70%, which is all in the um, Pasture Health Kit, which again is available from that MLA website, from the tips and tools, um, what, same website as you've got the tips and tools, the Meat and Livestock Australia. This is the Pasture Health Kit and it's also downloadable and it's quite a useful document as well. Um, so there's always been a lot of discussion about whether pH should be corrected. This is just a little uh, pro project that was done some years ago. Um, if you're past, if you have uh, an acid soil and you improve the pH using lime, don't get much change in subclover. But the important thing is, is that your good perennial species improving um, the number of or well, percent of uh, phalaris or improves uh, perennials that are there, they will increase. And um, the weed uh, vulpia, this is a grass weed vulpia or silver grass, it, is, um, it will decrease. So you will get a much better quality pasture if, you're, if you fix the pH problem in your soils. So, looking at some of our native grasses, weeping grass or microlina, very, um, it'll tolerate a, a much lower pH and higher aluminium concentration than red grass. If you've got a, a high, um, an acidity problem, um, you won't get red grass growing, it'll die out. This is just a little, um, this is our property again. Um, when we bought the place, this paddock, this paddock over here, which is all one paddock at the time, but we've had, we had fenced the creek off, it, would, it was known as cultivation because this paddock had been cultivated quite a few times. 
Now it's very hard to see, but there's a line down here, which is where the kangaroo grass is on the right, but there's no kangaroo, what's dead over this side is paspalum, but there's a definite line running down this, um, right down the creek, which um, shows where, the, where they ploughed to when they, were, when they were cultivating it. And this kangaroo grass, and we've owned this property for 20 years, and the kangaroo grass is on the creek, but it hasn't spread any further than where they ploughed it. Now they obviously didn't plough past this line because they fall in the creek, but the kangaroo grass has managed to, to stay growing along the creek edge, but hasn't regenerated into the paddock at all. And this is fenced off and it's been fenced off for nearly 20 years, and it still hasn't managed to recruit in the areas which were ploughed. So as I say, if you want to keep your kangaroo grass, keep your ploughs off it. Just a little bit of information on a, a trial. We, we saw some, in, um, this is when we started to get more interested in fixing our, um, our pH. A lot of people say, ah, oh, yes, but this has always been acid soils, this area. Yes, it has always been acid soils, but not as acid as it is now. And we know that because this area was predominantly a yellow box area. Um, which yellow box doesn't like growing in pHs below 5.4. The cemetery of Binder has a pH of about six. That's obviously not been cultivated. It's just been, you know, it's been a, an, an undisturbed area. It hasn't been farmed since white settlement. The pH there is six. About 90 years ago, they started doing a long-term study looking at the changes in pH um, in a farmed soil, it was actually put, it was actually done at Binder, which is quite useful for us. And the soil pH was above five. Phalaris at that time was very easy to establish, and that's quite evident because along the roadsides around here, where they used to just throw phalaris and, some, and superphosphate out of a plane, um, that phalaris is very easy to establish. And we know that the pH has been declining, and the aluminium um, getting becoming toxic to plants over the last 90 years. We know that, we can see that in, in farms. We soil test around properties all around here and we see pHs that are very, very low and aluminium levels that are very, very high. Just a little explanation of this. This is the, this is the results from the trial that was performed um, for 40 years prior to 90, uh, sorry, uh, 50 years prior to 1980. So the trial was started in the 30s. This was this project went, was published in the 1980s. And the interesting comment that was made is that, oh, there's a rapid decrease in early years, but the, but the, rate, of, the rate of decline actually slows. If you understand that pH is measured on a, on a logarithmic scale, not a linear scale, and we've talked a lot about logarithmic scales and linear scales in um, in the looking at COVID-19 cases early on, they, sort of they had it presented as on a logarithmic scale. Every one of these units is 10 times more, it, it, it's, five is 10 times more acid than four. Six is, five is 10 times more acid than six, right? So on a log, logarithmic scale, this is actually, um, the, the rate of change is only slowing because, it's, because the scale is different to what we'd see on a logarithmic scale. If this project finished in the 80s, and this, and this continuation of, of, um, of pH decline is still occurring, then we should be seeing this line heading towards 4.2, 4.1. And I think that's what we're actually seeing these days. So is, the, is that rate of decline actually slowing or is our acidification actually going up on a, on, a, on a linear scale? Is this what our rate of, of acidification is actually looking like? Are we still acidifying our soils at a horrendous rate? Now, what causes soil acidification is actually farming practices, farming processes, product removal. Um, the use of superphosphate does not acidify. Um, superphosphate actually, um, even though it's in an acid, it's made by making, you know, putting acid onto a rock phosphate. That's only to break the phosphorus down. 
Superphosphate itself is not acidifying. The process of farming and improving our farmland and getting our plants to grow faster and, and remove product and we get nitrate leaching because we've got clovers growing, that is the acidifying process. So are we still acidifying our pastures at the same rate? So what was our concern? That growing species that tolerate low pH don't address the problem because eventually we're gonna run out of those species. We're gonna run out of plants that can cope with that, that um, very high acidity, high aluminium, low pH. We were losing perennial species and the, nat and the uh, nitrate leaching was getting worse under annual pastures. So we decided to have a little look at, at what was going on. The recommendation not to lime was very important. So um, because our soils are high, highly erodible, we didn't want to incorporate lime by ploughing. But there's a fair bit of new data coming out from um, Department of Primary Industries down at, in the River Rana down around Wagga that is showing if you keep your soil pH, surface pH above 5.5, that produces enough alkalinity in the soil to raise the subsurface pH and lower the aluminium at lower levels. Um, speed of movement depends on your soil type and your rainfall. Um, we also saw some anecdotal evidence that gypsum sped up the, the, um, the lime movement through the profile. So we decided to set up a little trial where we had a paddock with a pH of 4.3 in the surface and 4.2 in, in the 10 to 20 centimetre layer. Aluminium was 18 and 31% in those two layers. And we put three tonnes of lime on an area of the whole paddock and we put half a tonne of gypsum to the hectare on um, the paddock except in one strip. So where the green is, we put lime, lime at three tonnes per hectare, gypsum at half a tonne per hectare. Where the red is, we didn't put any gypsum. We only put lime. Um, what actually happened to our pH? This was our starting point down here. The blue line is lime plus gypsum. The orange line is, is lime without gypsum. Surface pH went up in, in both. Subsurface pH bumped along at about pretty much the same. If, there was, if this was a trial and you did a comparison on these and did some statistics on these, these probably not significant. So the gypsum didn't actually um, speed up the movement. But you can see that our pH in the surface went up above 5.5, which was the desirable line, and our subsurface pH started to go up. What happened to aluminium, which is the toxic part of the, the um, that affects the plant roots? The pH in the, uh, sorry, the aluminium in the, in the surface dropped to zero in both treatments. Um, you can't actually see the, the blue line here because it's underneath the, or the, the orange line but our aluminium percentage dropped in the surface. Our aluminium percentage is continuing to drop in the 10 to 20 centimetre layer. And it's now down to 10%, which most plants that we grow in this district can cope with. So we're certainly seeing a change. Phosphorus um, in the top layer, uh, in the blue, in the, in the, um, Lime plus gypsum area is, is declining faster than in the um, area without gypsum. And that's more to do with the fact that the phosphorus is being used by perennial plants in the, in the um, lime plus gypsum, which highlights that um, the, uh, the, the law of the minimum, which says that if one nutrient is missing, um, then the you, your pasture production will um, will come back to the to the missing uh, uh, nutrient. Gypsum contains sulphur, and we know this paddock was sulphur deficient. So the area that had sulphur in it is actually using up the phosphorus by growing more pasture faster than the area that doesn't have the gypsum because the sulphur is lacking. The pasture is not growing. So what do our sulphurs look like? This is the, um, the part of the, this is the lime plus gypsum. So our sulphurs went up and is, is starting to decline because the plants are using it. But our sulphur didn't go up, obviously, in the area we didn't put the sulphur on. So our plants are actually now saying we're running out of sulphur. So um, it, it, it sort of really highlighted quite a few things. One is lime does move down the, pro, down the profile, which you can be seen by the pH and the aluminium levels. The plants were growing more, which indicates 
indicated by the amount of phosphorus that was being taken up by the plant and that our paddock was lacking in sulphur. It, it stayed, it was low before we started. Desirable sulphur level is about 10. So our, um, our area where we didn't put sulphur fertilizer on stayed, stayed low. What have we noticed in that paddock? The pH has increased at both depths. It's increased in the surface and in the subsurface. The, the aluminium has decreased at both depths in the 0 to 10, the 10 to 20. Um, in the lime plus gypsum area, we have more perennial grasses, fewer grass weeds, better clover nodulation, um, and plant uptake of phosphorus has been more than in the lime only step. I don't know if you can see it, we, they ran a, uh, 12 months ago, they ran a pasture nodulation day at our place. Um, looking at different pastures, different nodulation rates. And these clover plants have nodules, uh, which is uh, producing nitrogen for the, for the plant. Um, and there was, when we compared the sulphur area with the non-sulphur area, the sulphur area, the, the uh, nodulations were much better. More perennial grasses and fewer, um, fewer grass weeds, I estimated that using the pointed stick. I actually went out with my pointed stick and did 50 readings in each area and we certainly had more perennial grasses and fewer, fewer grass weeds in the area that had um, lime plus gypsum. So it highlighted the, uh, um, that law of the minimum. We were, we were sulphur deficient. Fixed the pH but we were still sulphur deficient. Just a little comment on Weed competition. Um, yesterday I stopped on our laneway. We keep our laneways relatively free of, uh, we don't fertilise them to start with and we keep them uh, grass free because this is part of our bushfire plan. We get a bushfire coming, all our stock are going into the, go into the laneways. There's a fence there and there's a fence there and it's gravel laneway through the farm. Quite a bit of weeds, you can see the cape weed here in the laneway, not fertilised. I stood in the same spot, I just turned a little bit to the north and this is a paddock and you'll see very very little weed very little cape weed and plenty of pasture growth in there so importance of soil fertility and good grazing management on um, on weed competition um, all of our paddocks that have been fertilized and grazed well with very very few weeds in there our laneways which we don't fertilize and don't graze well and we keep slashed plenty of weeds in there so this is um, just to finish off, and I think I'm running pretty well to time. Um, a well-fertilised, well-managed pasture has a lot of benefits for, for the future, um, for preparing you for climate change. It's certainly capable of withstanding climate challenges. If you, if you manage your pasture for productivity, um, for, for ground cover, your pasture, no matter what it is, doesn't matter what species it is, it's gonna be more um, able to withstand climate challenges. Ryegrass might struggle a bit because it doesn't like very hot weather, but there are other species that certainly can cope. A well-fertilized pasture can sequester carbon, whereas a non-fertilized pasture doesn't um, sequester, sequester as much carbon, mainly because the bugs use the nutrient that you're supplying to them to break down, to, to, to produce more carbon and more humus than a soil that isn't fertilised, which actually uses the organic matter to, to, um, for the, to survive. So, they, so in an unfertilised soil, you get less um, soil organic carbon. It does promote soil biodiversity. It's what we call rainfall ready. So what you need your pasture to, pasture to do, we've been told that our, past, our rainfall is gonna be more variable. We're gonna get more extreme events. If we're gonna get more extreme events, you're gonna have, and you don't have good ground cover, you're gonna have more, a high risk of, of um, erosion. When your soil erodes, it doesn't only erode the soil particles away, but it erodes away all your nutrients as well. And if your soil is rainfall, if your pastures are rainfall ready, they will cope with, um, um, well, they're, they're, they're going to grow. They're going to grow when you get rainfall. Um, if they're not rainfall ready, so in other words, you've overgrazed them, they're not well fertilised, they don't have the soil organic carbon underneath them to collect that water, they're not going to grow as well. They are more productive, 
They can compete against weeds. They nurture your animals, not just with feed, but um, if you've got weeds in there that are toxic, you're going to, um, your animals are going to be you know, struggling against sort of consuming weeds that might be dangerous to them. Um, and plus, plus they're going to get just more productive. They're going to get, they're going to be more productive if the, um, if the pasture is more productive. And if you do a good, have a good rotational grazing program, it will also control your parasites. So that's really the conclusion that I want to make um, about this pasture. So I think we'll be open for questions now. So uh, stop share, come back. Right. Are there any questions? Thanks, Helen. Um, that was very informative. I'm, I'm just checking the chat box now. Um, I haven't actually received any questions, so I'd like to invite anyone in, in the audience um, to, to pop your questions in now. Um, but I, I did have one uh, for you. Um, and that is when pasture is dominated by weeds, where do you think you could start to make changes to the pasture composition? Right. You've talked question. about that a little bit through your through your webinar but, um, mm. presentation, but like I, I just sort of even think out the front of my place, you know, there's this whole patch of um, cape weed, and I sort of think, where, where could I start to deal with that? And, and I, I I think that that is probably a problem for a lot of people this year. Um, I think this year we cape start? weed is, the cape cape weed is a huge problem this year. And it's because it was the timing of the rainfall and that a lot of our paddocks were, didn't have a lot of competition. Their pasture species were, were struggling. Cape weed's an annual and it will grow very, very quickly. Um, so we, um, we see it, we're seeing it everywhere. And it's less, certainly less in, in more um, productive pastures that have got ground cover to protect them from being invaded with weeds, but you know, this year was just one of those years that um, you know we like to we think of it as a cape weed year. It's also a clover year. I mean, we've got masses of clover as well. Um, so the important thing to use a to have a pasture that's um, the weed it'll be protected, but from weeds. Um, you've got to get your soil fertility right, and make and so your pastures are as productive as they can be or um, fill in the fill in the gaps fill in the ground cover gaps that are there to to uh, cover your soil so the weed seeds don't land on them um, so weeds like um, uh, sorrel and um, even Serrated tussock find it a lot harder to establish in a good pasture. Mm. So I think uh, fixing the limitations that you've got. So knowing knowing what limitations you've got. I mean, I did, so firstly identifying the pasture, the, the the weed that you've got, the pasture species you've got, and then fixing soil testing would be where I would start, and yeah. then fix those um, fix those limitations, and certainly fix your grazing management if that's been a problem to you. Yeah, okay. But, but it's a big cape weed year and if cape weed's an annual, the next year it might be a different weed. Might be dealing, we all might be complaining complaining about a different weed. Yeah, yeah. So you think that that's yeah. probably there because of the, the prolonged drought and, and um, it's just popped up in, 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 yeah. in some bare patches, yeah. It's taken advantage of the situation this year. The rainfall occurred at the right time. Mm. Um, the, and when when the pastures were were suffering, when the pastures had been water deficient and not able to, with you know they they were suffering a bit. We had the bit of bare ground opened up, and the and the cape weed said, "Whoopee, yeah, let's go." So Robin has asked, um, "You use three tons of hectare of lime. How much gypsum at that rate?" We used, used half a ton of gypsum per hectare. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was probably that could have been too much. Um, we were looking at the did gypsum fix the speed of um, 
of movement down the profile. That was what we were interested in seeing. So we oversupplied it. But if you were just fixing the sulphur problem, you might, you know, you can get away with using less, probably 100, 200 kilos to the hectare. But we went 500 just to see what the effect on the pH was down the profile. That's what we were interested in. So we've and got a from, side. Yes. Okay. From Bron, did you know that your soil was sulphur deficient prior to doing your trial with the gypsum and lime? Yes, we soil Indeed. tested it before we started. Yeah. And we actually were planning to do the trial in a different paddock, but that paddock, uh, the pH was, was um, too high to see a difference. It was already sitting at 4.7, 4.8. We had to pick a paddock that had a low pH and we also knew we had a low sulphur. But yes, we soil test every, we, we soil test every year. Uh, we possibly do a fifth of the farm a year with soil testing. Um, and we identify areas where we identify what problems we have in that paddock and we set out to fix those problems. Okay. Um, so this is from Christine. What's your approach of herbicides versus using pastures to outcompete weeds, particularly if the weeds are more dominant? Um, we don't use a lot of herbicides here. Uh, we we tend to try and use fertiliser. We use a lot of poultry litter. We don't use a lot of... Um, Superphosphate, but that's only based on price, not on uh, the fact, you know, a lot of people say they don't like using superphosphate because they don't like using um, manufactured fertilisers. That's fine, that's, that's an, their opinion. Um, but to say, we, or, or they want to be organic farmers, but we use poultry litter. Um, herbicides we use mainly to get rid of a particular problem weed. Um, so, you know, if we were going to spray for cape weed this year, we'd probably use Reglone or something like that. But it's highly toxic, highly dangerous. Um, yeah, we certainly try and control our weeds using um, grazing techniques and better fertiliser management. And uh, a lot of the processes that's in that uh, weed removers, the MLA document, what's it called? Weed removers and pasture mm. improvers. Yeah, uh, we tend to use that. If we've got to use sprays, um, we certainly spray Roundup around our new tree planting so that our trees don't get swamped by grasses. Um, other than that, we don't we don't really use a lot of. Um, that was a cup breaking in the kitchen. If anybody heard it. Uh, <laughs> That's um, all right. I normally yeah. have the dog barking, but I've got him locked away, so don't worry too much. Yeah, um, yeah, not really a lot of. Roundup, if we're going to sow a new pasture, um, we'll have that sprayed out. We'll get somebody in. Look, we've got some Patterson's Curse coming away this year, which um, normally we use. Um, uh, we've had the flea beetle here and the biological control agents here, but they suffered a bit through the drought. Mm. Um, so we're seeing more Patterson's Curse. Next year, if we see the Patterson's Curse again, yes, we'll probably spray for it. Okay. But that's the only sprays we're using. Okay. So um, Jenny has said thank you, Helena. Um, that was a really that was a really helpful webinar. Do you have any suggestions for managing pasture to reduce the amount of erodion? Uh, it's like cape weed. It's yeah. a, it's an annual. Um, yeah, it's another one of those pasture thingies that come in when it's advantage it got an advantage. Look, stock will eat erodion. Um, I don't. I, I'm hoping there's no toxic principle in it. Um, it was certainly there's some studies being done with horses grazing erodium. That's stalks bill, everybody, for those that don't know what we're talking about. Um, little pink flower with a, a seed head that looks like a stalks bill. Um, it's, um, uh, apparently it's high in sugar. So for those of you with horses that have got laminitic horses, Erodium will cause some, um, will, you know, hopefully not, but some horses may be sensitive to it because of its sugar content. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it, when you're considering about the different different pasture composition and the different species and, and all of those different aspects that come into managing a pasture. Um, yeah. So um, this one is from Christine. How do you manage bear patches as part of the weed management approach so that weeds don't take advantage of those bare patches? 
Um, again, making sure there's sufficient fertility so that the past, so that you can fill in those gaps with, with useful species. Um, I've seen people put manure on their bare patches and seed it down. Um, certainly, yeah, it looks, that's going to be very much on your soil type in the pasture you've got. A lot of native grasses don't, they're, they're pretty sparse, they don't fill in the gaps. Um, so knowing what your soil type is and do some gap filling if you can. Um, but it depends on how you manage that bare patches. Depends what the problem is, I think. Depends if it's a yeah. nutrient deficiency or a pasture deficiency or an overgrazing problem. Yeah. Um, so, so hard one. yeah, it may be worth looking at what's soil testing and actually seeing what's happening in those bare patches and what's happening in the paddock. Yeah, I did um, go to a friend's place one day and she had some big bear patches coming away and, and it was in the in a low part of the paddock and I thought it was salinity, so I soil tested it and it was actually aluminium. It was actually mm. pH. Her mm. pH was down to 3.9. Mm. Her aluminium percent in the topsoil was around 50%. Um, so when I looked at the paddock, when I looked at the problem, I sort of, I said, yep, it's salinity. When I got the soil test results back, it was pH. Yeah. So the problem, and the interesting thing was, is that when she, she did the three tonne of lime to hectare, like I suggested, they dumped the lime on those bare patches because, you know, it was an obvious place to, to put the lime to, as, the, as the dump, the fertiliser dump. And she said once they used the lime and there was, you know, they, they still had some lime sitting on the surface, she said the grass started to grow in those bare patches Mm. almost straight away so you know if you yeah. um, for those of you that are coming over to the plant ID um, session um, I'll be showing you a technique of of using a, a pH test kit and looking and looking down the profile at um, using one of those to, to assess if you've got an acid soil so bare patches could be acidity could be salinity could be mm. lack of fertilizer lack of nutrient um, so basically, it could be soils and the type of pasture you've got. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's a really good summary of what you've talked about to us today. And um, mm -hmm. just before I go to our final question, there's just a little bit of an opportunity for me to say that it's also something that the Small Farms Network is looking into through our um, Filling the Bear Patches um, project. Um, so, Christine. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm mean, just encourage you to have a look at our website and our projects. And there is a little bit of, um, of information there about what we're um, what what we're doing with three farms in the small farms network area about trying to manage those bare patches on a small scale. Um, so um, I just encourage you to jump on our website and have a look there. And I'll definitely be publishing some more information about that project very soon. Um, so just our final question, and I'm aware of the time, Helena, because we do have to get out to the site. And I really do thank you for a wonderful um, webinar so far. This one is from Lou. Um, aside from animal manure, are there any other good substrates to temporarily cover bare patch, bare ground when you are managing a small property? Hmm, good question. Um, look, the quicker you can promote pasture growth, better. So um even if you just rough up the, the ground a little bit and sow something that's going to grow fairly quickly coming into summer um you might try sprinkling some something like millet um mm. that grows very very quickly um and as long as we're avoiding the frost so you know supposedly Melbourne Cup days, the day we're supposed to, we can start planting our tomatoes. So you might even just go out, rough up the ground a little bit and sow a very, very fast growing um, species, uh, like millet, like what else, what else can we grow? Um, because it will start to grow now. Uh, it's only an annual, so you might have to consider um, growing something with it, but again, you know, if it's only small areas of bare patches, you could just get a bag of garden fertiliser even, you know, just, just a slow release fertiliser or 
something that's um, going to release fairly quickly or you know, something that's going to be available um, and do a shotgun approach on putting some fertiliser on it, sowing some, you know, roughing the ground up a little bit, sowing some millet. Um, what else is going to be a nice fast growing grass? Putting some tomatoes in there? <laughs> I don't know. Um, depends on what your um, situation is, but maybe a handful of lime, a handful of gypsum, a handful of garden fertiliser, a handful of millet, so maybe that'll just get in a small area, get it going, cover up the ground, the bare ground. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, what are we doing? Three minutes to 11. We're yeah, doing well. we are doing well. So look, um, Helena, just, just a few final messages from me um, that I'll just share on PowerPoint uh, and then we'll just come back and say a final goodbye. Um, I just wanted to let you know that the Small Farms Network Capital Region um, has a discussion group on Facebook um, and that's an opportunity for you to actually be able to um, join us and, and share, celebrate your successes and ask your questions and get some really great feedback from other small farmers and just have a chat about the types of things that you're doing at your place. So I invite you to um, join us there um, on Facebook if you would like to. Um, we also have published our previous webinars and also some wonderful videos that our volunteers on the, net, um, on the committee um, put up. Um, so you can join us in, um, on the Small Farms Network Capital Region YouTube channel. You can link to that um, from our website. Um, and I just would love it if you could please give us your feedback um, by filling out the survey um, that, I'm, that we'll put up after I've, I finish this um, webinar. Or um, I just invite you to send us an email at, at admin at smallfarmscapital.org. Um, and also just invite you if you've got any um, key points that you've um, learnt today, they're probably going to be a lot different to what I've learnt or could be different. If you've got any comments or um, if you'd like to shoot those through to me, I can uh, actually put them in, in, my, in, this, in the summary that I write. Um, and it's really great to get your ideas and um, impressions about um, what you learnt today. Uh, that's just a little bit of a shot of um, telling you where you can go for more information about the Small Farms Network. Um, and um, I'm just gonna say, Thank you. Thank you very much, Helena. It was a wonderful webinar um, and thank very informative. Thank and you, thank everybody, you very much for enjoying us. And I'll see some of you over at, um, down south from here in the next couple of hours. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Talk again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.